Good morning, welcome to Greece Baptist Church. We're so glad that each and every one of you is here this morning. Today is Sunday, November 27th. It's the first Sunday of Advent. Happy new church year. We are here together to worship God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We also join our Canadian brothers and sisters in opening our worship by acknowledging the land that we are worshiping on. We acknowledge the Seneca Nation, known as the Great Hill People and keepers of the Western Door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We take this opportunity to thank the people whose ancestral lands Greece Baptist Church currently occupies in Rochester, New York. And today we welcome Reverend Joy Berg Falk, who is going to be preaching for us. And we're also happy to welcome back Grace Wong, who will join us on organ with our prelude this morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Betty Ham, and I'm here this morning on behalf of the Board of Missions. And I want to talk to you about two things this morning. The first thing is, it is the season of Advent, and as we always do, we will be taking up an Advent offering. And I wanted to share with you the ministries that that offering will be supporting this year. Um, one of them is One Great Hour of Sharing. And I'll just tell you a little bit about that organization. It's an American Baptist organization that reaches out across our country and around the world. And they bring a tangible expression of love by walking with communities through times of crisis and disaster. And when a community is hit by a hurricane or wildfires or droughts, they show up with a coordinated immediate response and they also have long-term recovery uh, support in place in those communities through that crisis. So it's a really great organization and we've been supporting them for years. The second half of the offering is going to support Ricardo Menal, who is our missionary from Guatemala. And we were fortunate to have Ricardo with us last month and he shared the work that he's doing in Guatemala and he is building a network with other Christian community leaders across nine different countries in Central and South America. And they're mission is to bring peace through education and research and public advocacy um, and they especially focus on a message of peace and environmental justice and he's doing great work down there and we're happy to be supporting him the second thing oh well before i go on i just 
would like to ask you to consider supporting the Advent offering this year and supporting these vital ministries. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about is um, we have historically had an alternative gift market and we're not going to hold the market this year, but what we would like to do is still support the ministries in our community that provide outreach. So throughout the month of December and the Sundays of Advent, we will be having different ministries come and speak to us and share what is going on uh, in their ministries. And what we've asked um, in the past is if you would like to consider donating to one of these ministries as a gift for someone for the holidays. It makes a really nice gift, it's especially for people who really don't need anything, but you want to acknowledge them at the holidays. It's really nice to make a donation in their name um, and support one of these local ministries. And this morning, we are fortunate to have one of our own uh, join us to tell us about what he is doing. And so if you could please welcome Harold Files. He's going to share with you some work he's doing to provide desks for students in our community. Well, my project is sitting on the platform here, and it's a desk. And the purpose of the desk is to uh, help some child or children to have a place where they can do studying in their own home. And their parents can't afford to buy a desk and they're working off the, their bed and the things are falling off the bed onto the floor and they get a computer and, or they go out and um, sit at the kitchen table and try to work, and then one of the brothers comes along and says, get out of here, I want to um, use the table. And so it's difficult for young, young children to get started. And so um, I was, as you know, most of you, I was working and making parts for the pet project. Um, but the shops that I was sending it to, first was in, one was in, uh, the Catskills, and they got flooded a couple of times, and all of the men that are working in the shop were in their 90s, and so they decided that they should retire for a second time, so they didn't open the shop, so I lost that. And then uh, there was a place down in uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, that I got in with, and they were doing the same thing, and I was sending parts to them. But uh, they got into the bind of they couldn't raise enough money to keep going, and so they closed that shop. So then I'm looking for something, because I gotta have a purpose in life. <laughs> and uh, this is my purpose now to build these tables. And there's an organization called Family Promise that our church has been working with for many years. And uh, I, uh, black, I think it was a year or two years ago, Beth was here, she's the coordinator for that project, uh, was here and talking about family pro uh, promise. And their goal in life is to try to keep families together and not uh, get a hold of them before they wound up, wind up going on the street as, you know, unhoused and family living out of a car and stuff like that. And so their purpose is to um, help dad get a, a, a more sustainable job and, and mom to get to be out of the shop so she can um, feed her family without very much money. And, um, and so I thought, gee, there is a place where they could identify young children because that's what they're doing. They're trying to keep the family together. And maybe I could make some tables for them, in which I have. I've already uh, shipped uh, four tables to them, and I promised to make four more and ship them to them. The table costs me close to 40 bucks to buy the materials. And so, 
there's two things that I would like from the congregation, and that would be as if you would like to contribute to that project um, to help me buy materials and also to um, um, shoot me with something else to say. Don't get old. <laughs> um, oh, and I could use help in the shop if, if somebody would be interested to help, help me out. I live over at Unity right now. It's not very far from the church here. And uh, I have a, two garages that I'm using as wood shop. And uh, if somebody would like to help me out, we, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Our opening hymn today is Let Us Build a House of Worship, which is 793 in our great hymnal. Please stand in body or in spirit and we sing together. and will lead us in our call to worship. Please join me in the responsive call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our, our feet are, are standing, standing within, within your, your gates, gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem built as, as a city, city that is bound firmly, firmly together. together. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. 
peace to within your walls, and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. In the season of Advent, we watch and wait for Christ's coming. We light candles of hope, joy, faith, and peace, remembering the promises of God. This morning, we light the candle of hope. The scripture reading this morning is Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Hear the promises of God and the word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us join together in our hymn, Savior of the Nations Come, number 138. Please stand in body or in spirit as we sing together.
seated. Good morning. Some of you um, I know from the Coffee Connection, um, <clears throat> but I'm actually legitimately um, ordained clergy, so I am here on behalf of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on this first Sunday of Advent. I moved here next um, January, be 33 years, and so I've known some of you for many decades, and it's a delight to be here together. Our scripture from the gospel this morning is from Matthew 24, verses 36 to 44. But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one left behind. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one left behind. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an unexpected hour. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we're so grateful for gathering here together this day. And we pray that in these moments, it will be your voice we hear, that your Holy Spirit will speak and move through my words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Happy New Year. You look a little confused. Happy New Year. Thank you, thank you. So this is the first um, part of the Christian calendar. The Christian calendar bring, begins on the first Sunday of Advent. So it really is Happy New Year. In the lectionary, we've been journeying through the book of Luke, and now we turn to the book of Matthew. And I'm trying to adjust because it's a whole different framework. Today, thank you for the hands for lighting the hope candle. It's a candle lit in the darkness of the world. Advent actually begins with the mess. The recognition, recognition that the world is in conflict with God's dream for the world. Advent is the recognition of that. These are dark times. And often these dark times test my faith. How about yours? My greatest temptations with which I wrestle is to be cynical and enter despair in the background of the darkness. Now, for some, Christianity has been an escapist concept, the pie in the sky. A dismissal of this world, this earth, and the challenges within. And all those who have not been saved. Those who have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, so get saved so you can experience the sweet by and by. So this is based on dispensationalist theology. I'm sure you want to remember that word. You don't have to. But um, how many of you remember that song, I wish we'd all been ready? Because you'll be left behind. Do any of you remember that? Oh my goodness, we sang that over and over in youth group. Um, life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. 
Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. A man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turn her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears, and one's left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. How could you have been so blind? The father spoke, the demons dined. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. Isn't that a beautiful song? Actually, the, the melody is rather nice. Um, but I think when I was in junior high and high school, it still didn't seem to quite ring true. So this is ba based on um, uh, the rapture knowledge, um, theology, that God's going to come and pick out those people who are faithful. And um, if you have not centered your life in Jesus Christ, you're going to look over and your spouse or your friend or your child, child will be gone because they accepted Jesus. Will we be chosen? Are we going to be left behind? I visited a church I pastored some time ago, and this one woman came up to me and she said, Pastor Joy, you would be so proud of me. I've joined the church and I'm singing in the choir because I know Jesus is coming back soon and I want to be in the right place. Do you know what that's called? It's called fire insurance. <laughs> and it's based on a fear of God that God will pluck one and leave the other. So I better be good enough. Now, <clears throat> Some of you have heard of the predictions of um, Jesus coming back to earth on the second coming, right? Have you heard about that stuff? So I had my husband, who was homesick, uh, research a little bit for me, <clears throat> and he found from Wikipedia 47 times that has happened through the centuries. How about that? I remember when I was young hearing about people sitting out waiting on a hill Nothing happened. And it's not all in the past because there are four now predicting that for the future. Might be 23, might be 24. Well, I'll tell you what, the older I get, the less I know about eschatology and these things. And I'm grateful because it enables me to enter Advent in a different way, and I hope that will be true for you. What I have noticed is that sometimes the more people are um, uh, secure in their doctrine and convinced of their beliefs, um, and who pull into the preoccupation of the timing and literalness of the apocalyptic language, spend less time doing God's work. I remember growing up the arguments over the book of Revelation and the pouring through these questions. And some of you may have heard of this, you probably heard about it in seminary, about post-trib or pre-trib. Does that ring any bells? Is Jesus going to come before the tribulation or after the tribulation? Is it pre-millennial? Is it post-millennial? Or is it amillennial? Who cares? Is that what it's all about? I don't think so. I don't think so. And arguments and church divisions and splitting of churches, even splitting of denominations over these questions. At the same time, turning eyes away from the hurting and suffering 
in our world. So, I wasn't raised with the concept of Advent. How many of you were? Did you know about the Advent growing up? I must admit that it took me quite a while to understand it, because back where I come from, and in my first church back in the Midwest, Advent was a time to preach about Christmas. So we would pick our favorite Christmas carols and make sure every one of them go through the first week, for, through the season of Advent. That ring a bell to anyone? And then when I started to realize that Advent might be about something else and didn't always choose those beautiful Christmas hymns, boy, were there complaints. And you may have noticed this morning, these songs didn't sound very Christmassy, did they? That's because we're in the season of Advent. And Christmas does not begin until December 25th. And, by the way, does not end until January 6th, the Epiphany time. So don't take your tree down too early this year. But I've had to pick up my understanding of Advent all along, and I'll tell you that since I started following the lectionary that lays out the passages that you're supposed to preach from, it's like, what gives? This is the first Sunday of Advent, and this is the Gospel, and I have to preach on this? And you look at this gospel and set it aside, the candle of hope, and you think, how do these connect? Advent is not the time of the sweet, sanitized Christmas stories, but a passage that talks about warning and apocalyptic images, actually reminding us why Jesus came in the first place. And the intent of this passage is actually hope. God is going to do something. How does that sound? God is going to do something. And this all starts with Jesus. In the birth of Jesus, which we will celebrate on a Sunday, December 25th, when we celebrate Jesus coming into our world, and the world starts to shift. The world starts to shift. And so, this realm of God, this thing that God is doing, has already begun. And in theology, we talk a lot about the already and the not yet because the fullness has not yet come. So it's not complete. It's still the not yet. But this is introducing the scope of Jesus coming, a telescope with segments. God sees the injustice and enters into the chaos of our world, the already not yet. It's come, it's here, but it's not complete. And we are invited to watch, wake up, and hope. In Spanish, we say, no te preocupas, or uh, no se preocupan, which means do not, um, what's the word in English? I have it right here, preoccupy. <laughs> do not preoccupy. Preoccupy means that something is in our hearts and minds and we're kind of stuck on it. And in, in this world, with so much darkness, it's easy to get stuck on the darkness. It's easy to work upon that, worry about that. Almost every morning, I wake up asking God to bless the whole world, to heal the whole world. I'm one of those people that unfortunately seems to pick on the suffering, up the suffering of all the world. And it weighs on my heart. And that's when I am tempted to become cynical and to enter despair. What do you mean? It's already. Has it ever come? Is it coming now? And will it come? So I remember the Saturday after 
I was scheduled to build um, or lay out a labyrinth in the field of um, the YMCA camp. And I made the measurements a little wide. So this was a huge 11 circuit labyrinth. And a friend of mine, also clergy, came to that event. And we walked the labyrinth and I was on one very outside of the labyrinth and she was on the other extreme outside. It was a long distance between. Now remember, this is just after 9-11. And I looked at her after we had experienced such incredible evil and knew that she was part of the already and what is coming, that she was working for the realm of God, just as I was. And it gave me incredible hope. You know, you hear all the stories, the horror stories that come through the news. They're awful, aren't they? But you know what I, if you look a little deeper, you will see that there is someone standing up and responding to each event. It's kind of fun to pick on Harold. Harold's been doing this for a long time, haven't you? I remember those... Um, holiday fairs and the things that you had made. And I'll tell you what, look at this desk. It is beautiful. It is perfect. You know, if I built it, it would be, well, we don't want to talk about that. But isn't it beautiful? And it's an answer to poverty about, who child, about children who do not get the opportunities that we get and our children get, right? He's standing up to that. There was the horrific shooting at um, Club Q. And there was an army veteran there. And he was able to unarm the shooter and save many more from dying. He stood up. And then the mayor of Colorado Springs stood up. And others have been standing up. Think about the war in Ukraine, which is just unfathomable, don't you think? It is for me. And the people standing up for truth and justice. That's the realm of God at work. In fact, it's all around us, the realm of God working. It's working in this church. This church has incredible ministries, does it not? Yes, because you are standing up. You are a part of that coming. You are a part of that advent. Someone said, hope is an embrace of the unknown and the unknowable, an alternative to the certainty of both optimists and the pessimists. It's the belief that what we do matters even though how and when it may matter, who and what it may impact, are not things we can know beforehand. So this is apocalyptic uh, language. And growing up as I did um, with the You've Been Left Behind and the late great planet Earth and all of those, uh, don't let your kids watch them. They end up being traumatic, as I have found out in my work with people. Um, an apocalypse, when you think of the word apocalypse in a movie named with the apocalypse, what do you think of? It's the whole thing of being destroyed. But you know what apocalypse means in, in Greek? It means unveiling, revealing. And so today, we read a scripture from the Gospel of Matthew, and it's an apocalyptic passage that is, unreve is revealing what is not revealed. It is seeing Jesus Christ coming on behalf of our world. Isn't that amazing? That's hopeful, is it not? The Son of Man will come and heal, and did come. 
and that baby, Jesus, that we celebrate four weeks from today. So the message that is given to us, though we see through a dark a glass darkly, right? It's, it's not clear for us. Is that we are called to wait, to watch, and to do. The normative state of disciples is a state of readiness, and that includes us. Stay awake. Pay attention. Don't hide your head in the sand. It's tempting to just turn off the news, right? And ignore what is happening in our communities, our country, and our world. But how can we follow where Jesus is calling if we aren't engaged in that cosmic struggle between power and love? Some of you may have heard this famous quote by Karl Barth, who in the morning read the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other. Isn't that amazing? So today, if you read the newspaper, I haven't read it yet, have your Bible to this passage open at the same time. You know, it's good to look at passages in context, and in chapter 25, we have the story, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And do you remember what determines who are sheep and goats? It's when did we see you hungry, thirsty, naked, and in prison? And Jesus says, when you did it or did not do it to the least of these, that's when you saw me. So when Jesus comes back, and Jesus has come and is always coming, what will I be doing? What you, will you be doing? What will we be doing? What will our churches be doing? We have prep work, doing the kingdom, the work of the kingdom to which we're called. That's why Jesus appointed disciples, and that's why he invited us. The passage from Isaiah this morning held this quote that I have loved for so long. He will judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. Imagine that. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Wake up. Jesus came. Jesus is coming. Watch for how Jesus continues to reveal himself in the moments of your life and in the triumphs of humanity. And Jesus is coming again. We don't know what it'll look like. Don't ask me. But there is hope for us and hope for our world. Listen for how God is calling you into the revealing and the healing in Jesus coming to earth. Let us pray. We recognize that we live in dark times. They're confusing times. We don't understand why so much evil is allowed. We wonder where you are. We see through a glass darkly, and so we do not see many times where you are working within our world and coming over and over again. As we enter the season of Advent and prepare for Christmas, give us the courage to be awake and to watch and to do what you have called us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Joy. Please join me in the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Dear God, we ask that you be with your whole church throughout the world and people of all faiths as we work together to heal your world. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask for your blessing on the leaders of the world, the leaders of our town and our state, the leaders of our nation, the leaders of all nations, and even all of us who are leaders in whatever way we are. We ask that you would give everyone, all the leaders, your will so that we may bring about the world the way that you would like it to be. Lord, in your mercy. We ask you to be with those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, those who are serving in the military, those who are suffering from addiction, those for whom the holidays is a difficult time. We ask that you look upon our city and those suffering from violence and be with them, Lord, in your mercy. We ask your blessing on those who have gone on before us, that they may draw ever closer to you in your kingdom, Lord, in your mercy. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, your son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So let's stand up and sing our final hymn soon and very soon. It is number 677 in the hymnal. You may stand in body or in spirit as we sing together. Now in the love and grace and peace and hope of our Lord Jesus Christ, go forth from this place and bring that hope out into our world. Amen. Amen. Amen.